Hello and welcome to episode 256 of the Daily Fantasy Edge. My name is Adam Levitan. I am one of the analysts here at DraftKings. I'm the father of the most beautiful beast in the world, Jerry. And today we have a very special guest. I am excited to talk to this young man because his background is far different from my own and really the people that we typically have as guests on here. He was not in his mom's basement projecting target share for Jared Cook on a Saturday night. He was not playing Madden to learn how an NFL offense works. He is not a full-blown virgin like many of us fantasy geeks. He is, in fact, Matt Manicharian, formerly an actual scout for the Saints, for the Browns, currently directing the football and research team at sportsinfosolutions.com. Matt, what's going on? What is up? That is uh, definitely uh, an intro for the ages. I might have to like <laughs> record that one and play that back. <laughs> Uh, I first met Matt about a year ago when I gave him a serious beatdown in the ping pong streets at Spin. Not his fault. Serious beatdown. <laughs> I, I play ping pong almost every day. Matt never plays. However, uh, I had just found out about Sports Info Solutions at that point. And since then, they have really come on to the scene in terms of the NFL and data analytics world. We're going to get into a lot of that, Matt. But first, I think the people need to know because there's so many people out there that say, I watch football. Uh, I know who's good. Uh, I can tell you this guy sucks. I can tell you this guy is good. Uh, they think they can be an NFL scout. Why don't you tell them uh, how you actually get to be an NFL scout? Uh, it seems like there's a pretty pretty steep barrier to entry. Yeah, so, I mean, there's really two layers to that question. I think it, it's probably more interesting than meets the eye. In one sense, the, the line's never been thinner between being somebody sitting at home, being able to do your own analysis and be really good at that and what real NFL scouts are doing. Um, there's just so much available to you at this point in terms of the video as aspect. And that's really most of what scouting is at the end of the day, where um, you can learn a lot about the sport um, based on that sort of a thing. Now, I think obviously there, there is a difference there somewhere along the way. And hopefully NFL scouts that are doing this with all of their time and not having to worry about having another job and have years and years of expertise at this sort of thing um, are working at their craft and, and separating themselves a little bit more. But I do think where we're at now, biggest barrier to entry is probably like, did you play for somebody who can connect you with a job or are you related to somebody? Unfortunately, those seem to be the two most common ways. There's tons of nepotism still. Mm -hmm. um, it's really rampant. It's, you know, it's an old family business basically where you have these, these old owners. So I, I think that honestly, that's, that's the biggest, that's the hardest part. Cause there are lots of people that understand football that can do the work. And I think that, you know, as more and more different communities of people really get access to the film and really get access to the different forms of analysis, whether it be, um, you know, the football, uh, you know, quote unquote, traditional football analysts, like what we're doing here at SIS, versus what a lot of the great DFS players are doing um, and using the projections that they're doing. And the work is it, it's, it becomes like in baseball, it became really popular in the public sphere. And then as that kind of grows and grows and grows, all of a sudden the, the meeting of the minds that happens from all these people doing their public work and checking it and verifying it against each other, you, you have an explosion of just understanding of the sport. So I, I think we're at, we're kind of at the beginning and, you know, if you understand football, and I think it helps to have played, but it's not necessary to have played. Um, understanding football is understanding football, and that's why we're seeing you know female uh, assistant coaches popping mm -hmm. up around the league, and I and I think they're helping their teams much more than than uh, they're hurting them. Adding that diversity to the staff, that diversity of experience. I mean, that's always good when you're talking about team building. Yeah, I mean, you're referring to Bruce Arians getting two female assistant coaches on staff down there with the Bucks. I think anyone who has um, kind of a forward-thinking point of view in today's NFL is going to stand out and and help. Uh, how did you get the scouting job specifically, though? Because I think um, people need to know the creds, Matt. Yeah. So going back, I was uh, I played high school football in New York, decent high school football, um, and I was always a coach on the field type, very cerebral player. I didn't get by on my athleticism. I got by on my mind for sure. 
And uh, I wasn't good enough to play at Duke University where I went to on my undergrad. But right when I finished, I went back. I knew I wanted to do football forever. Football taught me things that I knew I wanted to give back to the sport um, for the rest of my life um, because of what it had taught me. And um, so I went back and I asked my old high school coach for a job. I started coaching the DBs and the wide receivers. And I was sending my resume everywhere. Uh, but I kept a blog up, actually. I kept a blog of the 2008 Miami Dolphins, just like really intricate football analysis, like every player on every play, detailed film review type stuff, um, like totally uninteresting, even for me at this point to go back and read because it was so detailed. Um, but it was a really good exercise. Um, and I was just kind of doing everything that I could, devoting all of my resources to that, that I wasn't spending trying to pay the bills. So, you know, doing real estate day jobs and stuff like that. Um, and eventually I got an internship through a friend of a friend of a friend type connection with the New Orleans Saints. It was really an internship for college kids, a six week thing over the summer, but I did it when I was uh, 22 going on 23, went coached another year of high school football, was doing other, you know, real estate in New York, paying the bills. Um, and then I went back to the Saints that second summer in 2010 and I told Mickey Loomis that time I wasn't going to leave. And he kind of laughed at me, but sure enough, uh, about six weeks later, he came and he said, hey, bad news, good news. You got to move out of the hotel, but you got to find a place to live, you know, for good down here. So that, that was how I found my way in. Um, I did some finagling with the uh, special teams coach. He wanted somebody to film the kicker's foot during practice. So I volunteered to do that in July. And uh, he didn't want to separate from it when the internship ended at the end of August. So that was part of the reason why. And I just grinded and grinded. And, you know, they saw that I knew that I was what I was talking about. And, uh, yeah, I think I was the first Jewish saint when I was down there. <laughs> um, I think people want to know what the day-to-day -day life is like of a scout, because I assume you graduated from filming the kicker's foot to an area scout or something like that. Uh, you travel around watching college kids all the time. Do you watch practices? Do they pay you? I mean, can you live on a on a scout salary? And... and I'm also curious, like, does every scout one day think he's going to be the GM? Is that like the goal to climb the ladder until you're like the head of pro personnel or you're the GM or something like that? I think that's definitely the most common thing. I, you know, like you hear coaches say, like everybody coaches to, to become the head coach. I don't know if that's always true with scouts. I think especially as you develop in your career, you might find that there are certain jobs that you're better for. And certain people really just want to be evaluators. They want to be scouts on the road. They want to be doing that work, which is very different from the work that you're doing as a director or as a GM, where you're, you're handling a lot of different variables that are coming at you. And you honestly don't get as much time to spend just watching the film and, and, and doing that sort of stuff. Um, life of a scout. So I started as a scouting assistant where I, I was doing pro stuff during the season, college stuff in the off season, but pretty much all in-house there. But yeah, after a couple of years of that, I got on the road. I was with the road for a year with the Saints and a year with the Browns as the Northeast Area Scout. And basically I covered every school from Maine to Eastern Ohio to the Virginia and every school, every draft eligible player that is in any of those states, um, actually, whether they're in school or not, pretty much any, any draft eligible player, period, they're, they're my responsibility. So usually you're talking about uh, seniors and juniors at, at different colleges, especially, you know, there are 10 or 11 schools that we identified as, as, you know, the big, you know, power five type schools that are in there where a lot of prospects come from. But um, you're, you're on the road and in the Northeast, you're going to a lot more different small schools, you know, whereas if you're on the West, there's probably, there's like two schools per state mm -hmm. that you really have to visit um, and let, except for special cases. So you're on the road, you're on the road, August, September, October, November, pretty much 10 out of every 14 days you're on the road. So you leave your, your home on Monday um, early in the morning to hit your first spot you're going to different practices and you're sitting in a room with a bunch of other scouts um you're seeing a lot of the same guys not from your team from other teams on the road as you go from school to school um you're gathering information it's a ton of character work you're sitting when you're going to the schools that's the thing you could look at film wherever you want anybody could look at film sitting at home but going in there you're a detective really so um, you've got to talk to all the strength coaches all the academic advisors everybody that you can to get a full picture of who this, who this person is, not just who this football player is, but most especially their football character is what I was always interested in. 
um, and you're in different hotels every night. You get lots of Marriott reward points. Um, it's uh, not great for your back being in the car all the time and being on be different beds all the time, stuff like that. But I mean, really, uh, it, if you love it, uh, I think it's, it's great. And yeah, you get paid. Um, you don't get paid well. You get paid um, a, a decent enough salary that, that you can usually make a living. Um, but it's not the sort of job that you, you're going to get rich from um, yeah. unless you do go up the ladder to, to one of those really high level positions. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't sound like a good job for somebody with a family. Like, you know, you have two kids, you're traveling all the time. You're not making that much money. It sounds like it would be hard. So is it a lot of young people, you know, people 30 and under and stuff like that that are doing it? It's really moved in that direction. Uh, guys that teams are trying to hide cheap young guys so that they can get more eyes out there. Um, I think that there's just a, an understanding that teams can do more efficient things that way in a certain extent. And they're really not valuing a lot of these kind of older scouts that, you know, cost a little bit more money. And then, yeah, if you're already, if you've already got a family, it's a very difficult sort of job to break into. And you'd have to have a very sort of understanding family <laughs> to, uh, to make that possible. A lot of times, you know, guys get married when they've already been scouting um and that's it's much more commonly the way that it happens rather than you see somebody that's already got kids that that, that yeah. gets going on the road um all right to, to me it seems like one of the biggest leaks and maybe i'm wrong here is a lack of self-scouting you know like yeah it's great to evaluate all these players all around the country uh, to me, not knowing the strengths and weaknesses of your own players on your own NFL team is just inexcusable. Like, how could you ever play Jamal Williams over Aaron Jones? How can you sit, you know, David Johnson behind the corpse of Chris Johnson? Uh, Travis Kelsey was a part-time player at the beginning of his career. Uh, is that the job of a scout? And, and shouldn't teams be paying attention to their own players more uh, or at least as much as they are, it seems like, to these college players? Yeah, you're spot on. Self-scouting is where teams have the biggest problems. Um, you have big problems between coaches and scouts that don't see eye to eye on their own players. And that can create big issues between those two departments when, when you don't have an understanding of what your coaches are looking for and what you're bringing in the doors for them and how they're feeling about the guys that they have and what they can work with and what they can't. And you're spot on. Self-scouting, I mean, Mike Lombardi, who I worked for in, in Cleveland and I have a tremendous amount of respect for, that's what, that's what he always started with. Most of the issues, it's not that, that you're evaluating college players and you don't really get a good understanding of, of oh, who this guy was versus that guy was. And, and that's why it doesn't pan out. It doesn't pan out because you don't have an understanding of what's playing on your team, what's playing in the league, where you stack up against your division, um, and this sort of a thing. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. All, all the uh, examples that you mentioned are things that it's just like, it, it's kind of incomprehensible. Like, how, how is this possible that we're still there? But, but yet we still are. And I, I couldn't agree more. And the big mistakes, I mean, the big team building mistakes are big misunderstandings in terms of, um, look at what the Giants did last year. No matter how you feel about Saquon Barkley and running backs in general and all that, and that kind of argument, this is a team that showed a real lack of understanding about where they were in their development cycle and who they and what their ability to compete was with the pieces that they had in place. And, and that's the really frustrating thing. It's not really a Saquon Barkley thing. I think he's obviously a great player, and there's a really great argument against running backs. Okay, those can both be true. But I, what I think is, is definitely like factually accurate is that the team had a misunderstanding of, of what they were doing. So whose responsibility is it? It's your whole team's responsibility. You've got to have great communication. You've got to be doing it in your coaching department in the offseason. You've got to be having your scouts be doing that constantly. And for me, one of the most important times in all of the year is the first or first two weeks of the year when you have all of your road scouts together in late July, early August, before they start hitting college training camps and you watch your own team and you understand your own team and where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are and what positions you need to upgrade at and what would constitute an upgrade at any of the positions on your team. Otherwise, you're just standing, you're out on the road, you're looking at college players and you're a fan at that point, really. Yeah. I mean, when me and you own a team, I'm going to devote 70%, 80% of my scouting resources to a self-scouting department, not to my college scouting department, you know, I, I would think there'd be way more value there. And what about all the stuff that we've seen? I, I know you guys have done this at SIS stuff like, um, you know, we are successful 70% of the time running 
over our right guard, but only 30% of the time running over our left guard. You know what I mean? It seemed like that would be a no brainer. Our team's talking about this. Is this like a new thing? It shouldn't be that mind blowing, right? Like it should be uh pretty football one one no? So that, that's not a new thing, what we're talking about there. So teams have been doing tendencies since the beginning of time. Um, I, I think that that's not a secret. And I think that there's a really big misunderstanding between like tendencies and analytics being like fundamentally, they're not fundamentally different things. They're kind of just mm -hmm. different words to describe uh, different, maybe like a more modern approach to the same process. But teams are understanding this stuff. Teams have been doing this kind of by hand for a long time understanding you know everybody's charting okay they ran off guard here the, this was a five yard gain this was a six yard gain everybody has their own definitions for success that sort what we're doing is we're we can do that for everybody and we can kind of automate it for all of them so they don't have to worry about all this stuff and then they can build off of that and take their analysis from there so um this this stuff is not new it's gotten a lot easier in the past few years just like watching films become a lot easier um and a, a whole lot of the the tools that we have make just understanding the game a lot easier but i you know the the real advancements something like an on off split like i remember there were great statistics that came out about earl thomas and the difference that he made to the seattle mm -hmm. defense on the field and off the field and you can look at all the different ways of looking at that you can incorporate the next gen stuff in there and it, it's just consistently but we didn't really have a great way of looking at you know quote unquote on off splits before we had kind of a little bit more computer power and a little bit more ways to control for different situations and understand this stuff because old stats in football problem with them was that they were just, they were kind of like just blunt, blunt instruments. Like yards is a blunt instrument and it doesn't tell you enough. Yeah. Uh, we need to contextualize it. Uh, all right. You've been around the league. You've been in the league. You've talked to all these guys. Tell me what their perception is of fantasy football, uh, both among players, among front office types, among, prospects uh are they laughing at us do they think we know what we're talking about uh, what do they think about fantasy football uh it's really interesting because it's different with the players and with the front office types i think the players get into fantasy football and madden and stuff like that uh much much more than the front office types do um, the front office and the coaches first of all you just don't really like have time for that sort of a stuff um, and I think a lot of them just really aren't aware how far the fantasy community has come in a lot of ways. I think there was always, when I was coming up, a respect for the gambling community. Mm -hmm. I know that our, our uh, decision makers were in touch with people that had a really good understanding of the business so that they could understand what they were looking at and what they were projecting and building that into all of our different strategic decision making, you know. If you go into a game thinking you're going to be playing for, from ahead or playing from behind based on the different things that the odds makers are considering that was really helpful because inside inside the building we didn't have a way of doing that now i think fantasy dfs i mean wherever there's money on it you have really great analysis going on mm -hmm. um, i don't have to tell you that um and so the more this stuff gets incorporated i don't think people i still think people think like oh fantasy points are stupid that's not a realistic interpretation of football i mean heck, i think that i joke around with the fantasy guys in my own office and i'll be like I have no idea who's a better fan. Don't ask me to who to play in your fantasy team. I have no idea who's a better fantasy player. It's not about talent. Like, um, but at the same time, um, the more, the more this stuff gets, gets integrated and around them and these ideas kind of leak out, it becomes hard to ignore um, is I think, frankly, the way to, to look at it. And then from the top down, the owners start seeing, Hey, there's some really interesting analysis that I read online that, that my daughter gave me. Why aren't we doing anything with this? Can we can we recreate this? And then all of a sudden, I get a lot of phone calls. So that's good for yeah. me. Yeah, I, I mean, shout out to Sean Payton. I don't know if you saw it. The coaches' meetings went on like a minute long, minute and a half long rant about how great fantasy football is and how great it's been for the game. I mean, any of these guys, the owners, front office guys, if they don't realize that the reason people are watching, you know, Jags, Titans, it, it's not because they love the game so much. The reason that it still gets huge ratings it's because fantasy football and because of gambling. I mean, it just it, it is what it is. I hope that they realize that. It seems like guys like Sean Payton do. Uh, I hope that more do. Um, I think I think you, you would. Uh, I think Sean Payton would be a guy that if you could talk to him, you would you would see that he's really got a reasonable perspective on a lot of things just like this. He came out um, 
about gun violence, for example, in New mm-hmm. Orleans a couple of years ago. It's just another thing that like, I'm not trying to get political here, but it kind of like common sense, like he's like, okay, let's get the rule right on this thing. And let's not use the example of when my team got screwed over. Let's use the example of when my team actually got the benefit of a missed call with the Alvin Kamara pass interference thing to make mm-hmm. the example. Uh, so I, I think uh, it, it's who he is as a guy. That's why he's such a respected coach. And he's, he's one of the most valuable assets in the NFL period. Uh, There is a lot of arrogance um, from people in quote unquote fantasy Twitter, uh, criticizing GMs all the time, criticizing coaches and their decisions all the time. Uh, I try not to do it because I'm sure it's way, way, way harder than it seems from the outside. I've never walked in the shoes of a coach trying to make a decision or or a GM. Um, And I definitely think there's way more things going on behind the scenes than we know about. But sometimes I can't help it, right? Like some of these guys just seem like they have no clue whatsoever. Now that you are on the media side, and I know you've had exposure to the fantasy side, do you think a team of like fantasy slash analytics guys, uh, people from completely outside the NFL cocoon, uh, shout out to our friend Evan Silva, uh, do you think that this fantasy analytics team could maybe do a better job than what we've seen from real NFL coaches and GMs in some of these cases Uh, just by kind of thinking about it more from a high level math and intellectual perspective than just a, Hey, let's go out there and get three yards in a cloud of dust type thing. So uh, yes, definitely. They could help. All these people could help. I don't know if you put, you know, this, this, you know, this this particular person in charge of a team, if he would actually do a great job as the GM, having had no experience with it, but Mm -hmm. you know, not taking it to the nth degree, these people would help teams. I think if you put one of these people in charge and you surrounded them with people that had experience that they could trust, I think you could do this stuff well. And I think to an extent, we've kind of seen that. I think like Paul De Podesta, if you looked Mm -hmm. at his kind of the the list of things that were like the tenets of how the Browns were trying to operate. Those are the things that have really helped the Browns to accumulate the assets that they have right now that everybody thinks they're such a hot roster. But uh, to think about like, there is stuff that we don't know from this side. And a great example of that, that I can think of is when I was a big fan of the NFL draft growing up, I thought I knew everything and I would be upset when my team didn't make a pick. When I actually got into the draft process, I learned that a lot of the times especially the differences that you see between like Kuiper's big board and what actually ends up happening. It's injury stuff that we don't know about. So a lot of, sometimes there can be something colossal like injuries where you're literally just like removing somebody from the board because they've got a degenerative condition. And if this stuff's not being reported on, or if we, if if this stuff's just not out there, um, it, it's something that you literally have no idea. So you're sitting there on the side and you just don't know. Like another one would be like, if a player has an injury that's kind of being hidden by the team or something like that. So you decide not to go for two, even though the math says you should go for two Mm -hmm. because you don't want to, you know, your right guards injured and you can't do anything, you know, without Marshall Yonda. So there are different things that go into it that like, we don't know everything, but at the same time, yeah, you're right. There's blatantly obvious things that we can point out. And like, after the, like, Three years ago, Andy Reid, poor game management decisions. It was kind of like, man, that's a lot of work for one guy right under that thing. We're all seeing this after the fact. It's much easier from where we are. At this point, when we've seen like teams around the league put people in charge of this stuff, give the help, devote the resources to it, it is inexcusable when we see these things continue to be floundered and and all over the place. So um, it's a little bit like both sides of the answer on that one, but, but I definitely think we could be doing better. And if it's, if it's people like you and Evan that want to do that, I'm in favor of it. Uh, I think one of the big things for fantasy, a leak that a lot of people have is some, uh, I don't remember who coined this, definitely not me, but assumption of rational coaching. Uh, in other words, uh, you assume that Aaron Jones is going to get 25 carries because he's the best back, but then what we have to k- put into the equation is, well, Mike McCarthy might not know what he's doing. And therefore we, you know, we can't assume that uh, he's going to do what's rational Um, with your background. uh, And you said you don't give advice on fantasy, but do you think that with your background as a scout, is it possible to say for you, well, uh, Hey, of course they featured Tariq Cohen in this spot. This was the perfect matchup for them to use Tariq Cohen here. Of course this was a Kelsey game and not a Tyreek Hill game because of X, Y, Z scheme. Uh, is it possible for us to predict this kind of thing, or should we just stick to um, kind of more straight and narrow and not try to predict game plans? 
We have had a really, really hard time predicting this sort of thing because coaches are so, so irrational. Um, if, if coaches were rational, we would see a much higher percentage of passing than we see right now. And all of the way that we project players, whether it's on my side of things or your side of things, wouldn't be about how many targets they're going to get. It would be about their actual talent, right? And how, how, what their yards per attempt would be in that situation. It, we can't rely on any of that stuff on almost any level. Um, and even in the situation where like Warren Sharp did the terrific analysis of the Super Bowl, kind of breaking down the personnel groupings based on SIS data mm -hmm. and nothing that the Rams did in that game, even when they tried going to their 21 or 12 personnel group and changing things up, it, they still didn't stay with it. They didn't seem to have prepared enough plays ahead of the game to really stay in that personnel group longer. So, so again, this is maybe a situation where we don't know what's going on. Like we didn't know what Gurley's injury situation was exactly. So it's hard to really pick on the coaches, but like, at the same time, it's like, no matter which way it was, you weren't doing the rational thing. And if I was predicting it, how do I know if they're going to do what I think is rational or if they're going to stick yeah. with what they're used to doing? With smarter, you can predict probably better with a, with a smarter coach. You can have more yeah. confidence in a smarter coach, but that's yeah. about it. Yeah, exactly. And I've talked about that plenty. Some of the coaches are way more predictable because they're going to do the right thing a larger percent of the time than, than the other coaches. Um, all right, I want to leave a lot of time here for listener questions because we got a ton of good ones. Uh, the people uh, had a lot of really good questions for you. So we're going to get through as many of these as possible here. Let's start with number one, Chris Rooney. He says, Adam, you've personally mentioned Spark Score several times. Matt Breda, Jerk McKinnon, most recently Miles Boykin. Uh, how are things like that weighted by scouts uh, versus straight film when grinding player evaluations? Um, uh, before you answer, I wanted to give a quote from Zach Whitman. Zach Whitman is the guy who actually reverse engineered the spark score. He runs the spark, uh, site. He said, not all good athletes are good players. Most great players are great athletes and very few bad players. I'm sorry. Very few bad athletes are good players. You know, basically it, it means you can be just an okay athlete and be a good player, but if you're going to be truly elite, most of them are truly elite athletes. Uh, so I guess back to the question, he's wondering, how familiar are you with Spark, with the kind of the athletic testing, and how do you grind that versus straight um, film evaluation? Spark score is awesome stuff. I think that teams for a long time have had a really hard time making sense of both scouting and combine or, you know, testing data. And I think there was a, a thought, you know, way back in the day where they started looking at, okay, the best college players are going to be the best pros. And then it didn't really work out like that very early on. The Cowboys created an early advantage in their scouting system by really incorporating a much more, you know, numbers-based system. Um, and get, and they, they built, you know, their first dynasty that way. And what, what you've seen happen over time is a real reliance on those different combine things. Even their, their, their scale that they used for trading picks became the ubiquitous one. And it's because so many things started from what they were doing there. And so the whole combine system, all the measurables, all the teams over time and enough, you know, copycat league got to a point where they were looking at these combine measurables kind of the same way. We have minimum like height, weight, speed requirements. We're looking at those things mostly. And it was, it was very unscientific, but at the same time, it was doing a much better job of parsing out who the good players were going to be rather than looking at how many rushing yards they had, right? Obviously mm -hmm. a running backs rushing yards, much more determined by his team, his offensive line than it is anything he's doing as an individual, if we know that he's 220 pounds and he runs 4-4, then we have a pretty good idea that he's going to be an NFL running back. So that was helpful. And then Spark Score really, I think, took that to a new level where you started to see real analytics applied to the combine measurables, to, the, to, to these different numbers, and built on that idea. And what a fantastic quote that you just read. It, the, the great athletes is really what you're looking for because I can't say it any better than he said it. So I think that's a really good thing. Now, when I was scouting, there was a frustration because as scouts, we always felt like we watch these players all year long. We are working really hard to put together our evaluations and understand who they are as football players. Why are we going to come in with some combine numbers at the end of the day and have everything? Uh, I see your colleague in the background there. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Jerry's, Jerry's shifting positions for those uh, that don't have the video on. Um, so, I mean... Um, I'm sorry, where was I? 
Yeah, it's about combine about the combine numbers coming in late and stealing the evaluation. Yeah. Yeah. So we would get frustrated by that and we'd say, Why are you, what you're doing in shorts is gonna is gonna reevaluate everything? And I was on that side as much as anybody. I really do believe and I continue to believe in the scouting more than these analytics. Now, what we've gotten to and where we're getting at SIS and what we're really working with our college data on getting more in the future as we especially get more and more data longitudinally of college players becoming NFL players, is taking the scouting measures and taking these combine measures and finding out what's predicted from it. And what we found so far is that it is the scouting measures that are more predictive than these combine measures. But when we start to look at the really intelligent combine measures and we combine them with those scouting measures, we start to see some of the, some of the, the most promising returns in mm -hmm. terms of what we can expect from the guys. So in New Orleans, you know, it was very much, it was a simple like, hey, we don't want corners that are slower than 4'6", and there were simple height, weight, speed, things like that. I think Spark took that to a different level. Now in Cleveland, we were doing our own thing as scouts, and we had the whole analytics team doing their whole thing, and that was being brought together by, by the GM, who at the end of the day just took both of those pieces of information, threw them away, and drafted Johnny Manziel. Um, <laughs> but, but... You know, really, I think the ideal thing is going to be mostly scouts, but but with with these combine measures trickled on top, gives us the clearest picture. Uh, I'm going to run an example past you of this uh, guy who came out a few years ago, Laquan Shredwell. I don't know if you remember if you studied him at all. Uh, he was a big, I think, debate between the analytics community versus the film grinding community. The film grinders certainly liked him. Um, however, his athletic testing was just a complete disaster. It didn't meet a lot of the thresholds that I found to be needed for an elite fantasy wide receiver. It didn't even dominate his college market share. He goes like 21st or 25th overall, uh, to the Vikings and has had just a completely disaster, uh, NFL career. Uh, that kind of sticks out to me as like the poster boy for, Hey, uh, he, you can watch him all you want. If this guy is not an NFL caliber athlete, it's going to be really hard for Laquan Treadwell to blow up, he still goes in the first round. I'm curious what your takeaway from that was, or if you remember that situation. So this is how I think about when when scouting and analytics don't match. If you think of if you think of scouting as like an analog tape player or a record, and you think of analytics as a CD or an MP3 or something like that, and you try to listen to a song and figure out if it, you think it's a good song or a bad song. If you listen to it in either device, right, whether it's the tape player or, or the MP3, and it sounds like a good song, then you have a pretty good reason to believe it's a good song. If, if you play it on both devices, it sounds bad. Pretty good reason to believe it's a bad song. If you play it on one device and it sounds good, and on the other device it sounds bad, you better ask yourself a lot of questions about what's going on here. And I think that's what Laquan Treadwell is. Laquan Treadwell is a perfect example of, hold on, take a step back. Whether I'm the analyst or I'm the scout, we need to get to the bottom of this. We need to figure out wh which side is wrong here. And maybe we're just not going to come. It's going to be one of these endless debates. As a GM, as a decision maker, I want to stay away from that player. Yeah. I think those are the players you let somebody else take their shot on. You let some, If the value gets good enough where it's late and you're saying, hey, you know what? This is the top scouting grade that we have left on our board. He's a little bit below what our analysts say, but it's, I mean, we're talking about a late round value here. Then, yeah, you go after that sort of thing. And I think your analysts should be behind that, too, if they're being realistic about who they are and having respect for their colleagues. Um, but for me, I'm always looking. I would even rather have, like, guys that my that both my scouts and analytics are kind of like positive about mm -hmm. rather than a guy that my scouts love and my analytics hate I, I I'd rather have everybody in consensus understanding and agreeing what the player is because then we're going to have a much better chance of having a vision for the player that we can see through as an organization yeah I think that makes sense uh let's go to question two friend of the show big josh aka Sir Giant, he says, who is the greatest athlete Matt has ever scouted that we never got to see play in the NFL? You have to have seen some ridiculous athletes. Uh, either LeBron James or Zion Williamson. <laughs> <laughs> How awesome would those guys be in the NFL? LeBron Wait, but he, he, was but like he asked if you Ohio. scouted. You didn't, you didn't scout LeBron James playing football. He's asking for guys you scouted. Oh, guys that I that I, I've had to watch them play football because I just like I walk down the street sometimes I see tall dudes and I scout them for <laughs> basketball in my mind. Um, but uh, the best athlete. So I mean that's a really interesting question. I don't know. I don't know that um, most of the great athletes they get a shot. Um, yeah. Guys that don't make it on a team, you know, like Josh Gordon comes to mind in terms of like yeah. his talent. We obviously saw him play some. So 
I don't know. Maybe this would be asking like who who my biggest miss is, like who the yeah. guy that I thought was good that didn't make it. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Some of the guys that 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 you've seen that maybe you really liked and didn't make it, and for for whatever reason, or guys maybe you weren't high on that ended up being stars or something like that. One uh one of the uh, best misses I can think of when I was uh, my first year I think scouting with the Saints, I fell in love with a running back from Stony Brook University named Miguel Masonette. Um, I thought mm -hmm. this dude like had it in every way. I thought he was going to be a, like a late round steal type guy. Um, and I think he just like came into camp one year, never made it out. Um, and honestly, I, I think running backs, my big mistake there was like going, going after a running back and trying to like really like figure out the big like running back thing. Cause there are so many guys at that position and there's so yeah. like so many guys with the lead athleticism that are going to get shots there. Um, so yeah, completely uninteresting there. Um, but that was one guy, um, guys, is there anybody you like, is there anybody that you've thought you like really beat the drum for that ended up really working out? Like they were like, Oh man, that guy, that guy, Matt really knew what he was talking about. We got this guy in the fourth round and Matt was right. He, he was, he was a steal. Um, guys that I can think of like that are guys that like we didn't end up with. Like I was really high on Allen Robinson when he was coming mm -hmm. out because I had had just the opportunity to see how he changed the offense for Penn state. He made people think Hackenberg was good. Yeah. I mean, this, this guy was a magician. Um, so he, he was a guy that I really loved. He wasn't a guy that we had an opportunity to get. Um, and I think of the yeah. good picks, I think of the good picks and I think of them, I think back to consensus with all the, the great people that I've had the opportunity to work with rather than, and then I think of, you know, going back to Cleveland when I had Khalil Mack and Aaron Donald in my region and I graded those guys, I think very appropriately for what they went on to become. Mm -hmm. And we stayed away and went for Justin Gilbert. I, you yeah. know, that, that sort of frustration doesn't leave you. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good segue to the next question here from Wakey Wakey. He says, how often does ownership override the front office because they want a player for ticket sales, even if not the best draft or free agent fit? And you mentioned Johnny Manziel. I mean... Um, you know, things like that seem to happen often when your ownership, when your front office team is somewhat weak. Yeah. Owners are the most important thing. Like, don't be a fan. Don't like become a fan of a team, like consciously without really thinking about who the owner is, because you could either set yourself up for just total misery or, um, hopefully the, not at all. Hopefully they are not ever in football overriding that because in football ticket sales do not matter ticket yeah. sales are are not a thing that you as an individual team have they don't have any effect on how much money that you make so um hopefully you're selling out all of your games anyway and you're sharing all of your nice tv revenues and that's what you're really concerned with and so what you should be trying to compete and have the best team possible um, and most owners understand that now yeah in in cleveland i definitely think that uh I remember seeing Haslam on TV say that a homeless guy told him to draft Johnny Manziel. So I don't know if that was for ticket sales or just like to help the homeless population of Cleveland <laughs> who've had a rough go at it. But um, that was one time that I can think of it. The only other times I can think of ownership getting involved, like thinking back to New Orleans was uh, Mickey and Sean maybe, you know, had come to the consensus and said, okay, we feel good about this player from a scouting perspective, all that kind of stuff. But there was a character concern with him or there was something that, that we need to clear with the ownership because the ownership mm -hmm. might want to know before you draft somebody if there's anything from a PR perspective they have to deal with, stuff like that. So that's just being kind of a sound businessman, making sure that you, you're, you're hearing through all the, the details. But overriding for ticket sales is, is crazy talk in, in football, at least. In baseball, at least, makes a little bit of sense to, to figure that in. Yeah, you mentioned the Justin Gilbert pick can you say how, how that went down and how frustrating it is for you to work and all the other scouts to work all this time and, and prefer other players and them still to go with Justin Gilbert I guess against your recommendation yeah so I mean we we went through the whole draft that year we went through the whole process honestly Mike Lombardi really did a lot of the stuff to set up that process of, of that draft in Cleveland that year and the rug was pulled out from under him and the new regime took over um, and we had those two first round picks and we had a lot of different options in that draft. You, you had a really good receiver draft there with, with players like Odell Beckham. You had those two defensive players that I talked about, you know, Aaron Donald and Khalil Mack. Uh, you, you, had, you had a lot of, a lot of talent in this draft um, from a lot of different directions. Not the greatest quarterback draft. It was really uh, Bridgewater, Manziel, Bortles, and Carr. Um, and from a scouting department, we were on – Bridgewater as the quarterback that we preferred out of those four. 
The analytics department also was on Bridgewater of the quarterback there. I don't think there was consensus to draft him at the top of the first round, but I think that, you know, both sides would have felt good about it later in the first round, top of the second type of thing. Um, there was our area scout who was in Texas A&M every day for uh, four years and knew everything there was to know about Johnny Manziel. And he said, don't draft this guy. He's a ticking time bomb. Like, literally, we had a thing where you had to sign off on a player. You said he wouldn't sign off on him Wow. Um, as a pick. Um, and then, of course, as far as the corner position goes, we didn't have any corners super high on our board. We had, like, two guys that we thought were, were solid starter-level corners, um, and the top guy was Jason Barrett. The second guy mm. was Justin Gilbert. Justin Gilbert had really long arms, though, and the coaching staff wanted a corner with long arms. So I think that kind of that pick was really like seeded over to the coaching staff, the new defensive coaching staff that wanted to get guys that fit their system in there. And there's a reason why you should have a, a personnel staff that makes these decisions. I'm not saying you shouldn't be consulting with your coaching staff or have, you know, consensus with them, but there's a reason you're studying these guys all year long, making your decisions and taking into account that, that Jason Barrett's not as tall as Justin Gilbert, but we still think he's a better player. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, that one, we're sitting in a different room as the scouts. It wasn't like new Orleans where we're all in the room and it's, it's a, it's a process. This was the dictator was, was making the decisions and we were, you know, we were off in a different area and we found out about it like the public did. And it was just like, Oh my God, we drafted who? Yeah. I, like, like I definitely thought Justin Gilbert was a worse pick than Johnny Manziel at the time. Right. And uh, as it turns out, I think that's, that remains accurate. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. Um, Next question is from Brodero20. He says, with the success of Sean McVay at his age, will we start seeing GMs at a younger age than normal to potentially have the same success with a younger frame of mind to think outside the box? You know, I've been accused of being an ageist with my evaluations. Um, I, and, you know, I can't help it. I, I tend to think that younger people are more willing to be forward thinking and, and maybe have um, sharper takes. I know it's not always the case. It's a bad generalization by me a lot of the time, but when we start seeing 25, 30 year old GMs, we're starting to see it in the coaching ranks already. Yeah. I, I think, I think we're going to start seeing people get younger as we, especially when you see that it works, but we got to look at the other sports. It's not like um, football is, is moving ahead of the other sports, baseball and basketball. We've seen a lot of kind of analytic concepts take hold. We've seen a lot of the way that these games have developed. Um, and, and what we've seen there is that, is that the GMs, are, are people that have more of an understanding of all aspects of this, that they're not just the old school long-term scouts that kind of Peter Principal their way, you know, they were the best scout. And so they become the GM. It's not that there's anything against that path. That's, that's, you've got to have one skill set that you come up through and there's nothing wrong with that, but making sure that you have somebody that understands all aspects of it. Um, I, I personally would rather have somebody that can be a really good manager of all the different aspects of an organization than be the master scout that I'm going to trust for, you know, mm -hmm. them to just have the magic eye and, and pick on all that stuff. So, I mean, we've seen in, in hockey, I think we have a 29-year-old GM that, that they're experimenting with right now, stuff like that. Um, these people are going to get younger. I don't know if it's going to get, you know, crazy young. We still have old school owners that want to mm -hmm. hire people that they can trust. And there's something to be said for that. But yes, with more success, I think definitely more of that. Right on, Brodero. <laughs> uh, question seven comes from Murray Communications. He says, which player measurement is the most overrated or underrated in predicting NFL success? Um, I have a friend here in Philly, I mean, he, all he thinks about is 40 time. He's like, oh my God, this guy ran a 4-2-2. He can't fail. Uh, I think John Ross is maybe, although I still think John Ross has a chance. He, he seems to be in the process of maybe proving that wrong. Um, I think arm strength, a lot of coaches have talked about for, at the quarterback position has become something they think maybe is third or fourth on the priority list for a quarterback. Uh, what's your opinion? Any overrated or underrated uh, player measurements? Arm strength is way overrated. It's not in the top three. It's not even close. Accuracy, decision making, leadership, and the ability to to affect others and all that kind of stuff is. A, I don't really care. It, you got to have a minimum, uh, like proficiency in terms of arm strength. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, the ability to throw the ball through the you know through a brick wall doesn't separate you at all. In fact, it it, it seems to be a negative indicator a lot of the time for a lot of these players. So, 
Um, I think it's really position specific. So running back 40 times, not really that important. Um, speed score is something that that's, that's a little bit better, but even so um, it's just not, uh, it, you don't have situations where that comes up in a game and it doesn't see some, seem to be something that really separates the great players f- from other ones. So that's, that's definitely an overrated one. Uh, quarterback height, that's one that's that's in vogue right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely think that's overrated. Maybe some underrated ones are more interesting. So arm length. I think arm length at every position, people are starting to wake up to that one a little bit now. But to play offensive tackle without that arm length, I think is tough. Um, ooh, height. Running back height and defensive tackle height. Those ones are overrated for me for sure. Defensive tackles, I go back to the arm length. You don't want to have like arm length that's that's debilitating. But at the same time, you're getting through tight spaces and you're moving really quickly in there. It's not a situation where it matters in the same way that it does at offensive tackle, defensive end, where you've got to really be able to keep somebody off of you um, in, the, in that sort of way. I think we've seen shorter defensive tackles succeed more. Um, yeah, those are the top ones. Oh, jumping. Defenders, like the jumping stats are better than the running stats. If you look mm-hmm. at the broad and vertical jump, that stuff's more predictive of success for almost every defensive position than yeah. the actual 40 time is. Um, it's these kind of explosiveness measures rather than anything else. Um, but really all of them are overrated uh, on some, uh, to some degree, I think, uh, because they're just easy things to wrap our heads around that we can all have a data point that we all agree on where it's harder to do that with, with scouting. Yeah. Um, so we just, I think we have a tendency to overrate them a little bit. Yeah. And I think adjusting for size is something that every, I assume every team is doing now, but I mean, obviously a six, three wide receiver running, you know, a four, two is much more uh, impressive than a five ten guy doing it, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that should be a no brainer. Um, yep. question eight from Michael Dubner Do teams further subdivide positions. For example, when putting together a big board, do teams have slot wide receiver rankings and outside wide receiver rankings or just wide receiver? So this is really interesting. The way we actually subdivided receivers, and this kind of ties into the last question, is we actually had the description of a wide receiver and then what we would call a big wide receiver. So you separate this out into two different situations because if you have a guy that's 6'3", he doesn't need to run 4'4". So you're looking for something a little bit different. You're looking for somebody who's going to play different receiver positions. Now, a lot of times, how does that correlate? The small guy is the slot receiver. The big guy is the outside receiver. But in in modern times, a lot of times, we have these big slot receivers Mm -hmm. now too. So you can see that going the other way around. So we don't – now, we will categorize. So you'll usually have two separate stacks, or maybe you'll have the stack and you'll kind of tilt them off just to the side of one another so you'll know like the regular wide receiver versus the big wide receiver. You could also split it off by slot and and wide, but the way that we handle that in our report writing is we define if a receiver is only a slot receiver, if he's only an outside receiver, or if he's both. And then if he's both, you got to describe it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But as you're describing these players, um, understanding kind of their size and shape along with their inside-outside ability, that's important for for your team building. But then at the end of the day, you know, you're going to combine all of your positions into a single stack anyway. So when you go into the thing, you better understand, okay, if we get a three-down starting level wide receiver that plays inside or outside, that's where our 6.7 and above grade starts. To, if you if you have a are just a first if you're just an outside guy or just an inside guy if you're only a third down guy the maximum grade you could have even if you're perfect as that is a six point four in our scale mm-hmm. and we're very strict about that because that's this is sort of the the Michael Lombardi Patriots way uh, scouting method that 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 I bought into a lot of the way which is what position do they play for our team not what round is this player you know like just made up out of thin air. Uh, it came to mind to ask you about the whole slot receiver kind of ascension that's going on in the NFL right now. And specifically with fantasy, I mean, the, a lot of the best fantasy wide receivers now are playing the slot. Um, Juju Smith-Schuster comes to mind, Michael Thomas, like these really awesome wide receivers. And I think teams and sharp teams are realizing that there's huge mismatch advantages in the slot and putting guys who can play in there who are also may happen to be their best wide receivers working really well. Um, have you noticed that? Uh, do you think that's going to continue? Is there an adjustment to be made on defense to say, hey, uh, we can't get Keenan Allen against our linebacker 30 times in a game? Uh, they have to adjust, right? Yeah, so you so you would think you're doing, you're doing this sort of thing. You're going to get teams out of their zone. 
Um, and you're, you know, so that they don't have that linebacker lined up over that player, that Michael Thomas or something like that. But we've seen teams be kind of stubborn about that at certain times this year. My favorite adjustment that we've seen defenses doing, um, I remember the Colts doing it at least a few times, sending a, a linebacker out to play like where the corner would usually play in their mm -hmm. cover two. If he's matched up on a running back out there, you could still play zone. You don't necessarily have to go man, but you're kind of shifting around the positions, you know, where everybody traditionally plays there. So that was, that was a genius adjustment. Uh, the key thing to understand is that slot receivers, the average slot snap, you're going to get more yard per out run than the average outside snap. So across the league, it's, it's a little bit of an easier, um, it's an easier place to create yards, uh, you got a two-way go running from those those slot receiver positions. Um, you're creating the matchup problems that we're talking about, where you can help dictate the man zone type stuff that goes on there. Um, so I think we're going to continue to see more games like that. We're going to continue to see more adjustments where that goes. The key thing that I would just say is to make sure that that as you're putting together your different lineups and projections, that you're having an understanding of where you expect these guys to line up and relating that to how much projection production you expect them to have, like. Devin Funches is a guy that comes to mind that hardly ever lined up in the slot mm -hmm. in Carolina. And I think we could figure to see him in the slot a ton in Indianapolis this year. I think that's going to have a, an effect on his, on his target share. Yeah. Yeah. It just seems like the quarterbacks are also finding it easier uh, to complete passes out of the slot. Obviously their a dot is usually shorter. I mean, it just, it just breeds fantasy success. It seems like, and, um, certainly something to the keep most, an eye The on. most efficient passes are deeper down the field, especially around that 20 yard range and yeah. between the hashes, yeah. uh, between the hashes is the most, it's the most efficient part of the field to attack based on all this stuff. If you line somebody up in the slot there, I mean, you look at what the Rams were doing this year. It's part of the reason I thought it was so genius was you're also creating a situation where you're kind of packing the box. So if you have guys like a Cooper cup, who's actually a capable mm -hmm. blocker, even though he's really a, a Z receiver for you, all of a sudden now, like, just like Gronk gives you the thing like, oh, do we put a defensive back on the field? Do we leave a linebacker on the field? All of a sudden, you've got you've got a different version of that same kind of conundrum there defensively, having all these guys packed in the box with the ability to block and having to figure out how you want to counter that. Uh, last question we are going to do today comes from BMS DFS. He says, what is the most ridiculous thing you've heard another scout let influence their opinion on a guy for example, he has the right chin for baseball. And I, I've heard this. this. There was a famous quote, I think, in, in Moneyball or whatever. The guy yeah. said, you know, he's got to have a strong chin to play baseball or something like that. Have you heard anything like that uh, in football while you're out there on the road? So you're not a big fan of the chin evaluation. <laughs> That's not my kind of evaluation. The most ridiculous and in retrospect kind of like offensive thing that I think you still hear a lot is looking at the quarterback's girlfriend. Um, there is a belief that's like an actual thing that people say that like, um, you know, if you're like around like an Eagles fan, who's like a really big Foles, like loves everything about Nick Foles and they'll be like, I think Foles is better than Wentz. And you'll kind of look at them and you'll be like, are you telling the truth? Like, and you can tell deep down, they really, really believe that that's the way that scouts will be like, be like, Hey, have you seen his girlfriend? Mm -hmm, yeah, I think he's going to be a real player out there. And it's like, what? I, and you'll hear the rationale and be like, okay, they have a lot of confidence. Somehow it means that they have a lot of confidence. And so they can like lead their team and like they have this personality that attracts beautiful women. So, and then they mm -hmm. have like, but it, it, yeah, it's kind of offensive. <laughs> like, if you really think about it, like, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's superficial is what it is. Yeah, that's, uh, that's probably, I mean, people I think are definitely, uh, anti like Josh Rosen I think like yeah. because of a lot of like things that he's said which is mm -hmm. like a veiled way of being anti-semitic I think yeah. um, <laughs> so there are a lot of ridiculous things we did the brick test in in Cleveland where we had to ask the all the guys that we interviewed at the combine we put them on a video like we we recorded them on an iPad and we had to ask them how many things they could think of that you could do with a brick in under one minute and we recorded them answering this question I don't know what any of like our psychologists thought they were going to do with that stuff, but that was, yeah. Like if that influenced anybody's opinion, like maybe that's why we drafted Justin Gilbert. I don't know. <laughs> that is an odd question. All right, uh, Matt, this is super interesting. I, I love finding out about what's going on in the real NFL because uh, so many times we're critical and we think we know what goes on behind the scenes, but we're really, uh, we do not. Uh, tell well, the now people, you know that you do actually know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, tell the people where they can find you, where they can get the book. By the way, uh, Sports Info Solutions has put out a book 
on every single prospect in the NFL draft. As someone who does not watch a lot of college football, uh, I will be consulting it very much going leading up to the draft. Tell the people where they can find you, where they can find the book, uh, what else they can find. Yeah, check out the SIS Football Rookie Handbook. What we've done, so at SIS, we work with all the NFL teams providing our different analytics. We also have uh, the largest scouting department in the NFL. And so in this book, you get a side-by-side for every of the top 250 players in the draft, a scouting report, NFL style, based on what I learned with the Saints and with the Browns. And then next to that, you get the analytic breakdown with a bunch of different numbers, help you describe who these players are, where they line up, what you can expect from them on that pro level. Um, so a really good, um, I think, a, a resource for any fantasy player kind of before the season trying to get to understand who these rookies are in the draft. And then also as you're going through the season and you have waiver spots and you want to figure out, okay, these two guys that I've never heard of both have a chance of getting some opportunity next week. What did the handbook think of what these guys could offer? Did they line up in the slot a bunch in, in college? You know, whatever else it is that you wanted to see there. So check out the SIS Football Rookie Handbook. It's available on Amazon, and there's a Kindle version available now too for just 15 bucks. Um, and then you can check me out. I'm on the Off the Charts Football Podcast every week with Aaron Schatz. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Matt Mano at M-A-T-T-M-A-N-O, Sports Info Solutions at Sports Info underscore S-I-S. And did I cover everything? I think you got it. I think that's everything. Um, thanks for having me on, Adam. I had a great time. All right. Really, thanks for being here. Check out all the stuff at S-I-S. I've been referring to their stats. You guys have probably seen on Twitter during the season and stuff like that. Oh, I got one more. Go ahead. SISbets.com. We are rolling it out starting tomorrow for the first day of the MLB season. SISbets.com has prop bet recommendations for all for a whole bunch of different baseball prop bets based on baseball info solutions, aka sports info solutions data. Really interesting mm-hmm. tool. Just starting the rollout now. So you guys are the first ones to know about it. Um, mm-hmm. check out SISbets.com. It'll be free throughout the month of April. Mm. Yeah, prop betting is speaking my language. I think for the common man, I think one of the only ways to actually win in the sports betting revolution will be through props. So that's certainly uh, interesting to me. All right. He said it all. Matt, really appreciate you being here. For Jerry on the couch, for Luke on the controls, for Matt up in Copley, Pennsylvania. No one knows where that is. I barely know where that is too. I am Adam. Good luck, everybody. We are promoters at DraftKings and also avid fans. Our usernames are Adam Levitan, Al Smizzle, and CSU Ram 88 We may sometimes play on our personal accounts in the games that we offer advice on. Although we have expressed our personal view on the games and strategies in this podcast, they do not necessarily reflect the views of DraftKings, and we also may deploy different players and strategies than what we recommended in this podcast.